So lately I've thought about doing a theme month for my channel since I've not really done anything like that before, but I couldn't think on what to do a theme month about. And then it hit me. With me doing lots of videos about British animation and kids entertainment, let's take a look at the biggest and most successful British animation studio ever. Aardman. I think that we've all seen at least one Aardman short film or movie, and we all know Wallace and Gromit. Their constant use of claymation, British charm, and quirky sense of humour has given the longest run of any British animation studio ever, running almost 45 years, and it's made them by far the most successful too. So let's take a look at their proud and charming history throughout the month of May. Now, while I'm going to take a look at all of their motion pictures, I'm not going to take a look at everything they've done. If I did, that would take me forever. So for now, I'm just focusing on their films, and the duo that got them started, Wallace and Gromit. Maybe I'll take a look at their other short films and TV shows in the future, but that would be way too much for me to do in one month. But if you'd like a more in-depth view of their entire history, please check out the awesome documentary A Grand Night In on Netflix. But for now, let's get this marathon started. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Ard May. Let's get things started with Nick Park's first major release, a short film that took him nearly a decade to complete, and has the traditional stop-motion film staples of being weird, slightly creepy, and very charming, but all from that laid-back British style that, in all honesty, hadn't really been seen in stop-motion beforehand. Many of you already know this story, but for the sake of fun, I'm recapping it anyway. Wallace is a kind, eccentric man from Wigan, Manchester, who loves cheese and is somewhat of an amateur inventor. His inconsistent skill ranges from idiot with a saw and a glue gun, to absolute savant who's capable of making things that even Einstein and Tesla would be jealous over. Alongside him is his silent and fateful slash long-suffering canine companion, Gromit, who is the more level-headed of the two and often has the job of pulling Wallace's ass out of the fire when things get tough. You know, I've always wondered how these two actually met each other. I know we get a little glimpse of that in the movie and there is a comic series and a Telltale game series that might go into greater detail on that, but as far as I'm aware, we never actually gotten into an official origin story. Anyway, as stated before, Wallace loves cheese, and when thinking of places to go on holiday, he thinks that they need to go somewhere where there's lots of cheese. Cheese! We'll go somewhere where there's cheese. And of course, in the cartoon world, there's no greater place for cheese than the moon. So Wallace and Gromit make themselves a rocket to go to the moon to try its cheese. But as it turns out, not only is the moon bizarre in that it has an atmosphere, but some unfriendly characters live there too. So maybe they actually landed on the moon from Power Rangers. <laughs> After so many years of seeing the effect of this movie had on its creators and the industry in general, it's funny to see just how simple it is compared to the stuff we've got today. Now don't get me wrong, for a student film from the late 70s, at least that's when it was started, this is unbelievably ambitious, but its very slow pace, laid back feel and its arguably creepy second half, I'll get to that later, does make this seem a bit underwhelming compared to what came later. It just feels like there's a lot of points where nothing is really happening. And and in later productions, they'd fix that with some really clever and unique jokes. Here, there's a little like that, and while there are definitely some clever and interesting gags, the fact that Park was working on this by himself did mean that there's a lot of the short that feels a bit lackluster and amateurish. It just feels like what it is, really, that being a student project. But when evaluating it on its own, it's still very charming, and one of the things that makes Wallace and Gromit so enjoyable is their chemistry together, and Wallace's brilliant vocal performance by the late Peter Salus. Wensleydale. Prior to Wallace and Gromit, Salus had starred in a lot of things on British television. Most significantly, he played a role in the classic Doctor Who serial The Ice Warriors, played Ratty in a stop-motion version of Wind in the Willows, and most famously starred in Last of the Summer Wine. But it's fine to think that the role that would define his career came in the winter of his life. He was in his 60s at the time he did the voice work. And he didn't even get to see the results of his labours until nearly a decade after he did it. But his soft, endearing Midlands accents and the tone of his voice really 
really made this character come alive. Set coordinates for 62 West Wallaby Street. I really couldn't think of anyone else playing the role, either back then or now. And the character himself is great. The absent-minded northerner with a penchant for tinkering, who always meets adversity, but his innocent air and optimistic quality makes it so that nothing really ever gets him down. No crackers, Gromit. We've forgotten the crackers. It's a really enjoyable character, and he just feels like the kind of person that we've all met in our lives. And his partner, despite having no voice, has a lot of personality too. You can tell that he's the more logical and sensible of the two, and despite the fact that he probably finds living with Wallace tedious and a bit of a handful, you can tell the two have a strong and rich history together. And it's a real testament to Nick Park's skill that he can give Gromit so much emotion and character just from his facial expression and body language alone. Supposedly, Wallace was inspired by Nick Park's own dad, who also enjoyed a bit of tinkering in his shed, and Gromit is based off of Park himself, and the two are very endearing, and ironically, do have a bit of a father-son chemistry. But with the father in this regard being more senile, so the son is a bit more logical and effective of the two. But they clearly have a strong connection, and this connection is one of the things that makes the two so watchable. But regardless of who the characters are meant to be, their first journey out together helps cement their place in animation history, even though when the two actually make it to the moon, it's a bit underwhelming. And isn't it ironic that not only did the two start off with an adventure that often most cartoons or comics would do near the end of their tenure, but also how it's not as exciting or enjoyable as their literal more down-to-earth adventures that they would have in the future. Even the bits before they go to the moon have this really dull and empty feel to them, and I get that it was kind of supposed to, but it's just not very enthralling or engaging. However, one thing that definitely made this short memorable for me was the villain of the short. This short introduced many elements that would become synonymous with Wallace and Gromit and Aardman in general. The quirky sense of humour, even though a lot of the jokes are very subtle, and not given much attention to, which allows for the greater appreciation on them and repeated viewings. The laid-back feel, the use of details in the background. But the most significant thing to be introduced from this special was Aardman's great ability to make really creepy and intimidating villains. Starting off with this mute moon janitor robot thing, that despite looking like an old 1950s cooker on wheels, through a mixture of his motions, creepy sound effects and the brilliant music, just ends up being a really unnerving character, which definitely had me freaked out when I watched this short as a kid. Speaking of which, for a very low budget film, the music is surprisingly epic, especially near the end. And while it doesn't play often, any time it does, it really drives home the emotion and the feel that Park wants to convey. <laughs> You forgot to light the fuse! <laughs> And it's one of the many things that makes the climax all the more enthralling, despite how uneventful the first act is, which is another thing that's become a great staple of Arban Productions, amazing end set pieces. One last thing to say, of course, is the animation. While, like everything, it looks very amateurish, stiff, undefined, blobby, and also rather inconsistent at times, the simple charm and simplicity of it, and the great design, still make it interesting to watch, even if said designs haven't really been put to their full potential, but that's what sequels are for. Plus there are some bits that do look very impressive for the time, like the rocket taking off and the robot skiing at the end. It's also funny to think that even after all these years later, Aardman still makes the fingerprint marks visible on their models on purpose, which is unbelievably cute and charming. Gromit comes off the best looking in the shore, his models are always smooth and his motions come off the best. Sadly Wallace's models do look like something a ten year old would make on a bored Sunday afternoon, and the visible fold marks of places like the elbows and do ruin it a bit. But as I said before, Salus's voice acting does bring life to the character that allows you to get past that. Overall, while in comparison to what came later, A Grand Day Out isn't the most impressive stop motion short of all time, it is still very charming to watch now. But if you had to only watch one of the Wallace and Gromit shorts, this isn't the one I would recommend. Which one I would recommend, you ask? Well, Stay tuned for that, because both the career of Nip Park and Aardman have only just begun at this point, as has Aardme. Ah, my very first Aardman production, and Wallace and Gromit production for that matter, I ever saw was The Wrong Trousers. It was one of the films I had on video when I was little alongside Toy Story 1 and 2, A Bug's Life, and the Paul and Linda McCartney music video collection. 
don't ask. As such, this one has a very special place in my heart, and is one that I immediately think of when thinking about Wallace and Gromit. But even in spite of that connection, this is still one of the best things that Aardman has ever done. It's Gromit's birthday, and Wallace gets him a pair of techno trousers, which is really just a way of him getting out of walking Gromit, which might sound harsh and lazy, but Wallace has got his own priorities, most notably that the pair have been running into hard times financially, so he's forced to take a lodger, a mysteriously silent penguin who may have some ulterior motives of his own. The scale of this short compared to a grand day out is spectacular, where the last short you could tell they only had about three sets that felt very enclosed, this special has the whole town opened up to the pair. A very empty town, granted, but with the more lavish environments both indoors and out, much more ambitious camera movements and effects, such as the camera following Wallace as he walks up the wall, and even a POV shot. And despite a more basic premise compared to the previous short, the story is a lot more complex and exciting all throughout, involving separation, a burglary, and a pair of mechanical trousers. Plus, whatever animation flaws that were in the last special have been completely ironed out, and now the process has been completely perfected. The motions are a lot more smooth, there's very few visible fold marks now, it's a lot faster, especially near the end, I'll get to that later, and there's an infinite amount of more detail both in the models and the backgrounds, and overall it just looks a lot more polished now, even with the little things with Wallace and Gromit's ears flapping in the climax due to the speed that they're going at. That's an almost negligible detail, but the fact that they thought of it is so brilliant. There are some small niggles here and there, but they're barely noticeable in the grand scheme of things. It's also a lot more emotional compared to the first short. There's a very tender moment where Gromit leaves Wallace after he feels like he's been rubbed out by the penguin, and it genuinely feels heart-wrenching, especially when you consider that we'd only had one episode of the two so far, so we don't know a lot about them yet, so it would seem completely likely that Gromit would never come back. Speaking of the Penguin, he's the next in the line of great Aardman baddies. Going by the name of Feathers McGraw, he's once again a testament to how great a villain can be, even if they don't talk. And while he's not as scary as past and future antagonists, and his lack of eyebrows does give him a rather expressionless face, hell, it makes him look like he's surprised at everything he sees, his diabolical scheme and cold-hearted nature definitely makes him a more memorable villain. Plus, hey, it's an evil penguin. How many other stories have one of those? This was the first Wallace and Gromit short to introduce the now staple of the franchise, Wallace's inventions to help get him up in the morning, since apparently Wallace likes to start the day feeling like he's a marble in a Rube Goldberg machine. But it was a great way of Park expressing his creative abilities and give the Wallace and Gromit shorts a brand new sense of identity that has become its greatest staple, and even becomes a plot point in the short, which is incredibly clever. It's the wrong trousers. The wrong trousers. This special also won up the previous short's climax with a bit less tension but a lot more motion, intrigue and above all, fun. With the duo running around the living room on a toy train track trying to catch Feathers who's brandishing a gun, which is a pretty intense motif now that I think about it, but it just makes the end set piece all the more exciting. Plus it's the first time that the two have been in mortal danger. Then again, if they can survive walking around on the moon, they may actually be immortal. It also proves that despite the lengthy and slow process the animation takes, that the end result can still be very fast paced and fluent. I mean, just look at this. This is some of the fastest animation I've ever seen. Though if you do stop and think for a moment and apply some real world logic, you realize that this living room to scale would be about 50 feet long. Gromit at some point seems to have three arms and that spare track pieces box must be from the Time Lord since it never goes empty. But hey, it's a cartoon. This feature of the franchise was one of the biggest defining features for the pair, and would be one of Aardman's biggest and most beloved traditions throughout all of its history. It also gave the pair their now stapled iconic looks, with Wallace's wide face and trademark smile and teeth, but with being more well defined than the last special. Even the animation looks a lot better, whereas the first one, due to taking years to make that had parts that looked very inconsistent from scene to scene, and the motion and designs only look one level up a child could do, this one looks a lot more polished, professional and the lack for a better term, like a real stop motion animated movie. What's helped to make that feel though is how everything looks like it's had an upgrade, with the style of plasticine Park was using, what he had used to construct the sets with, the quality of the sound recording and the music, the camera work, even the credits look better. Though the special does suffer from the fact that even though the world seems to be more expanded, it still looks like Wallace and Gromit are the only people to inhabit this world, though thankfully they seem to realise that with the future short. Overall, The Wrong Trousers is a 
brilliant sequel and it still keeps the overall style of being a very simple slice of life of this very odd duo like the original but with still a lot of excitement and simple subtle humour and in my opinion the best of the Wallace and Gromit franchise. If you only had to view one of them, make it this one. And so we come to the last of the original Wallace and Gromit trilogy, which arguably is the best, yet ironically the least remembered, which is all the more ironic given the icon that was created through this special. This is the first of the Wallace and Gromit lineage to introduce another defining feature of theirs, that being that they seem to switch jobs between every episode, which is a great way of introducing more set pieces and situations for the pair to come across. In this special, Wallace and Gromit are window cleaners, and when doing a job one day, Wallace comes across the woman of his dreams, a yarn saleswoman called Gwendolyn, voiced by Anne Reed. And while the two seem to hit it off well, Gromit notices that her dog, Preston, seems to be up to no good, and while pursuing him he ends up being framed and thrown in jail, which requires Wallace to help break him out with some rather unusual help. This is the first short to have a character that Wallace can talk to and have them talk back to him, and she's a very good vocal supporting character. Well, I... What was it you wanted? Oh, the spanking. You've done a grand job. Windows are our speciality. Goodbye. Chalk. Many people say that she's just a female Wallace, but I think that's a bit unfair. She's a lot more reserved and shy than Wallace, and it's quite sweet. And she and Wallace have good chemistry, and Anne Reed does a great job with her very sweet and gentle delivery. Despite that though, this is also the darkest and most emotional of the Wallace and Gromit franchise, not the least of which due to the slightly overall, but still very well done music. <laughs> But regardless of that, the story has some incredibly emotional moments that make you totally feel for these characters, and see them in ways that you hadn't seen them before, and it really ups the emotional moments from the previous short. As for the darker parts, well, I have to say that any animated short meant for kid that involves sheep rustling, jailbreaks, mincing and other dark elements that I won't reveal here, since there are some cracking plot twists at the end, is dark in my book. The intro sets the tone perfectly with some of the darkest music and most suspenseful moments I've ever seen in the series. Said plot twists are both amazing and terrifying in their own right, and that all comes down to the main villain, Preston, once again having the same amount of vocabulary as the previous villains, but this time it is incredibly intimidating. With his literal bulldog look and imposing figure, this is a mutt that you'll be scared to pet. And once his secret is revealed at the end, you'll be hiding behind the sofa, as I did when I first saw this as a kid. But of course, the character that everyone remembers from this short is the one and only Sean the Sheep, a feisty little lamb with attitude that ends up getting roped into this odd mystery and became iconic for his do-anything-he-felt-like nature, similar to Deadpool if he was British. And no, that doesn't count. Who proved to be so popular of a character he spawned hundreds of merchandise, his own spin-off show, then a spin-off of the spin-off called Timmy Time, and even his own movie, which we'll be getting into later on in the month. Which is impressive for a character who can only speak in BAZ! <coughs> But then again, that's a one-up from most of Arbman's mute characters since he can still say something. Speaking of which, it's amazing to consider that at this point in their career, half of the characters Arbman had created didn't say a word, and yet they still had a great amount of personality, which just goes to show how talented Park and Lord are with their craft to be able to make mute plasticine so alive and have so many expressions. Speaking of which, the animation has had a major upgrade from the previous short too, now with incorporating things like moving cars, planes, loads more moving objects on screen at once, and of course, the porridge gun. All of this leads into the most intense and dire Wallace and Gromit yet, and while sadly the climax isn't quite as memorable as the previous, it is still very enthralling and funny at the same time. It's also the longest and biggest in scale of all the short's climaxes, starting from around the halfway point, and it just keeps going and gaining momentum until the final showdown between Gromit, Sean and Preston, which almost feels like a set piece from an old platforming video game, and it's awesome, if a bit intense for a kid's movie. But hey, at least there's no guns 
this time. This short also upgraded the ambitious qualities of the last special, with incorporating more impressive camera movements, set pieces, and now introducing the now staple of Armin animation, all the little details, such as the signs in the background and all the little gadgets Wallace has on in his house, which are always charming little easter eggs to find. They experimented with this in the last short, but it was brought to its full realisation in this one, and it's great to have something like this that encourages rewatch value. This was also the first Wallace and Gromit short to introduce another staple that would become synonymous with the company, that being a group of interchangeable creatures or characters that would make great comic relief. In this movie, that comes from the sheep, of course, who are incredibly funny by just being around in odd and awkward moments. And in future Arvin productions, this would be mimicked by the rabbits in The Were Rabbit, the slugs in Flushed Away, and the elves in Arthur Christmas. Even though by virtue of story, character moments, and scale, this is probably the best of the Wallace and Gromit franchise, I'd still recommend watching The Wrong Trousers over this one, since the darker tone of this might be a bit ostracising if you haven't seen the others first. But this is still a great short, and it takes the two to the next level in terms of characters and as a franchise, but... Arbman's efforts caught the sight of another up-and-coming animation company, and thus Wallace and Gromit was shelved for a few years after this, for Park and Lord to move on to bigger things. And what were those things, you may ask? Well, tune in to the next episode when Arbman's partnership with DreamWorks begins. After their success with the first three Wallace and Gromit shorts, Park and Lord were invited to join DreamWorks and make movies for them. Park pitched the idea of The Great Escape with Chickens, and Spielberg loved the idea, and the two got to work immediately to bring this idea to life. And so, in 2000, we were given the full-length stop-motion animated classic, Chicken Run. Many people often praise Chicken Run for being the first fully stop-motion animated feature film, though that's not technically true. Creator of the California Raisins commercials, Will Vinton's The Adventures of Mark Twain, was actually the first, but Chicken Run was the first one to get major mainstream attention, and to this day is still the highest grossing stop-motion animated film of all time. But does it really deserve to be that praised? Well, let's find out. On an intensive chicken farm in the 1950s, run by the terrifying Mrs. Tweedy and her long-suffering husband, Mr. Tweedy, the pair keeps several chickens to run a floundering egg business. But it's definitely not all sunshine and roses for these hens, with their squalid living environments and the constant threat of an axe hitting their neck if they can't lay eggs anymore, their lives are miserable. So the spunky, kind and determined chicken Ginger, voiced by Julia Swahala, tries time and time again to break them all out and try and reach their proverbial paradise. But unfortunately she is met with failure every single time. And yet her head is never cut off, but there you go. After another failed attempt, and another one of their friends being given the chop, all hope seems lost. That is, until Ginger spots a Rhode Island Red Rooster flying, and subsequently crashing, into the farm, and gets the idea to get the chickens to fly out of the farm too. With the help of the cocky cock Rocky, played by Mel Gibson, the race is on to get the fat birds into the air, as the Tweedies have come up with a more pastry and gravy based fate for the chickens that spells disaster for them all. One of the biggest problems that Aardman had when starting to go into full-length movies is that a lot of their plots they used for the films were rather derivative and predictable. Considering that the plots of their shorts, despite being smaller, seemed more interesting and unique, and sadly this film is where that trend started. But that's not because of the similarities to The Great Escape, since very little about this movie is comparable to that movie. It's how it used plot devices and beats that we've seen in tons of other movies before, which I won't give away here. And while they're done a little bit better here, than in others, it does mean that if you're familiar with these beats, you know exactly what's going to happen from the first 20 minutes. Despite that though, a lot of this movie still feels very unique and has some great scenes in it. From the scenes where the chickens are trying to learn how to fly, to Rocky saving Ginger from the pie machine, which again looks like something out of a video game, and as always, one hell of a climax. And of course, one of the things that makes these scenes so good are the characters. Ginger is really likeable due to her kind heart and determination. Bunty, played by the great to Melda Staunton is great as the group cynic. Well, haven't we tried yet? We haven't tried not trying to escape. Babs, played by Jane Horrocks, is lovely in her innocence and endless quotability. I don't want to be a pie! I don't like gravy. 
Fowler is enjoyably curmudgeon -y. Timothy Spall's Nick is a great little Tom, Dick and Harry style side character. The tension's killing me! He's gonna kill her! <laughs> Plus any role that he does is automatically gold. And Mr. Tweedy, while not having much screen time, is enjoyably stupid. What the dickens? Norms now. But of course, the character that everyone remembers is the pants crappingly terrifying Mrs. Tweedy. And chickens, you dolt! Apart from you, they're the most stupid creatures on this planet. They don't plot, they don't scheme, and they are not organized. Played by an unrecognizable Miranda Richardson, Mrs. Tweedy is a character who, despite having the traditional bizarre Aardman facial structure, commands attention and fear in any scene she's in. And that really comes across down to Richardson's amazingly cold delivery and her character's intense facial expressions. Her plan is so basic and is arguably understandable from a certain point of view, but the way she goes about it and presents it, it makes it seem totally diabolical. This woman could make the idea of feeding puppies in an orphanage seems sinister. This will take Tweedy's farm out of the Dark Ages and into full-scale automated production. <laughs> By far one of the greatest villains in an animated film ever. Get the chickens. Which ones? All of them. I'd say the only character to really suffer is Rocky. You get the idea that he's supposed to be a wise-cracking fast talker, but his delivery just doesn't seem right. You see, over in America we have this rule. If you want to motivate someone, don't mention death. Like he knows what he's saying is a lie and he doesn't believe it. And I guess that that could be part of his development, that he eventually learns to drop his act and just be his real self. But you don't really see any change in his personality even by the end of the film. And sad to say, I think it really comes down to Gibson's performance. And while I can understand why they got him, I think someone who's a bit more well known for playing these types of characters might have worked better, like a Jim Carrey or a Jack Nicholson, or perhaps even an Eddie Murphy. And hell, this was produced by DreamWorks, they could have gotten him. Also, with Rocky being a Rhode Island Red, his accent should be a bit more East New Yorkish rather than Gibson's Westchester accent. But the character still has some good lines and is enjoyable to watch, I just don't think he's used to his full potential here. Despite those flaws, this movie is still really enjoyable and despite the plot beats being very predictable when they do happen they really hammer in the emotion of it without resorting too much on cliches like moody pop songs and dead space in the narrative the way the characters act is very natural plus it helps that the whole movie has this feel of dread and death around it it makes it all feel a lot more suspenseful so when things look bad it feels bad speaking of which the funny thing is is that despite being a cinematic film it still feels as enclosed as the Wallace and Gromit shorts. We don't really see outside of this farm until the very end, but that actually works to its advantage. It makes the captive quality for both the characters and the audience seem more poignant. This isn't just a farm, it's a POW camp. And that makes it more clear throughout the movie that this is a place that is miserable, which does make the movie seem more dire, but it does make it seem a tad depressing at times. But whenever something tough does happen, it's picked right back up again in the next scene. It reminds me a lot of the Don Blue films in that regard, particularly all dogs go to heaven as its main character was a lot like Rocky and hey, there's another person who would have been better for the role, Burt Reynolds. Also, despite this still being a rather small production, the upgrade that Aardman gave their animation is stellar. The scene where the chickens are training and moving in perfect unison, and just seeing how many moving characters there are on screen, it's incredible. Especially considering that this all had to be done by hand. No copying or tricks. What you see here is what was really going on in the studio. It's amazing to see, and proof that Park and Lord are such pros at this. And what while the more barren environment means that we get less great background jokes that we got in Wallace and Gromit, you don't really notice that with the amazing quality and fluency of the animation, which is only getting better and better at this point in Aardman's history. Overall, even though this movie is a tad overrated in my opinion, it's still a triumph in terms of animation and home movie ambition. It shows that even the smallest filmmakers can rise to the top through hard work and creativity, and through a mixture of enjoyable characters, great set pieces, and really unique tone for a kid film, and thus the world of Hollywood was opened up to this little animation shed from England. But what would they do next? Well, stay tuned for that.
And so we come to Wallace and Gromit's magnum opus, their first and only cinematic venture. While it's certainly great to see them on the big screen, and it does result in a really entertaining film, I feel that a feature length wasn't really the thing that Wallace and Gromit were made for. But for now, let's just take a look at the plot. In the duo's ever-changing careers, they're now humane pest control, helping clear people's gardens of vegetable munching rabbits in preparation for the big veg fest in their hometown. After finding out their enclosures that they put the rabbits in are getting a bit too overcrowded, Wallace tries to come up with a way to brainwash the bunnies so that they'll no longer like vegetables anymore, and despite some hiccups, it seems to work. That is, until a massive rash of violent veg violation happens all throughout the town from a supposedly giant rabbit, dubbed by the townsfolk as the were-rabbit. And of course, Wallace and Gromit get on the case to sort it out, but doing so may be a lot harder than they first imagined. As stated in the last video, one of the many problems that Aardman had when going to the medium of full motion pictures is they tended to adopt plots and narratives that were rather derivative and predictable. With Wallace and Gromit's first and only foray into film, however, that wasn't necessarily the case. The film has a plot that, for the most part, you don't really know where it's going, and that's very impressive, especially from Wallace and Gromit's story, and it results in the title characters going through the things that you'd never thought they'd go through before. I won't say what the big twists are here, since it would ruin a lot of the movie, but needless to say, it's definitely a change from form, and in a good way, and while some might be able to predict the plot from just the title, it still goes in directions you wouldn't expect when involving these characters. Sadly though, despite the plot being very creative and effective, one of the reasons that made Wallace and Gromit's shorts work so well is that they took stories that were wacky and large in concept and shrunk them down to be more down to earth, partly due to the charming tone that these shorts were known for, but mostly due to how they were only 30 minutes long, and thus they would have a smaller scope to them, which you might think might make this movie perfect as they were able to take the story to its full potential, but it does seem a bit jarring to see a very cinematic scale in a franchise that's made its money from being very quaint and homespun. That being said, this by no means ruins the movie, in fact it's still great to see Wallace and Gromit go through more than they ever have done before and this could have been the perfect bookend to the franchise. Of course it wasn't, but that's neither here nor there. Also, as a side note, I feel that the behind the scenes of this movie proves emphatically better than any audience reaction how off the wall Arbor movies can be, in that it was going to originally be called The Great Vegetable Caper, but Jeffrey Katzenberg, the head of DreamWorks, advised against calling it that since vegetables don't test well with kid audiences apparently. Yet genetic realignment and puppets made out of Play-Doh are fine apparently. Speaking of DreamWorks, after the success of Chicken Run, they must have really let them go wild with the budget and equipment, since the sets and animation are some of the best in Artman's history, especially near the end. And while the climax of this movie isn't quite as exciting as the previous shorts, it's very different from normal and it's still very gripping, particularly given the revelations that are made in the third act. Also, this is the largest cast of any Wallace and Gromit story, now the whole town of Wigan is along for the ride, and while they're not as fleshed out as the side characters in Chicken Run, their vocal performances do provide a decent job in making them memorable. Helena Bonham Carter as Lady Tottington is a hilarious but charming aristocratic love interest for Wallace. Consider yourself dumped though their chemistry is nowhere near as adorable as him and Gwendolyn. Nicholas Smith as the easily fretted vicar is a great role. Mrs. Cropley from the Vicar of Dibley's actress Liz Smith does a great job as Mrs. Mulch. Aye, and I hope they give them pests what's coming to them and all. And of course we have the great Edward Kelsey, aka the Colonel from Danger Mouse, as Mr. Growbag. Kiss my arty choke. Who is always a great addition to any cast. Even Peter Kay's cameo as the police officer is a decent role. Hey, give over! Mental. Sadly, despite everything in this movie successfully capturing a very cinematic feel, the villain was not one of those things. With such a great lineup of rogues in not just Wallace and Gromit shorts, but in the Aardman gallery in general, it's a shame that the movie villain is rather disappointing. This was Aardman's first attempt to make a more jokey villain with Victor Cordemay, and while that will work to their advantage in the future with the Toad and Queen Victoria, here it just comes off as rather disappointing, especially when he's not really that funny. Granted, he does have a few funny lines, and he is performed well, which comes down to the fact that he's voiced by Ray Fiennes, but that makes him even more disappointing given that he's played other villains so well in the past, and the thought of having him as the villain in a world as surreal as Wallace and Gromit is so exciting, and yet it's just wasted here. Then again, it would have been a bit of a far-reaching hope to imagine him as good as Ramesses and Prince of Egypt in this movie anyway. Also, this might be a bit of an odd observation, but did anyone think the innuendos near the end were a bit out of place? I think 
think you deserve this, Gromit, for a, a brave and splendid marrow. <laughs> Matron, take them away! Overall, while the movie is by far not the best of the Wallace and Gromit franchise, I really don't think it deserves to be treated as the black sheep of the lot like it tends to be. The plot is intriguing, the scale makes the set pieces a ton of fun, and we still get the same lovable characters that we always have, but I can see why some people were disappointed in this, especially since it seems as if DreamWorks were continually interfering with the process and trying to make the movies their own, and this will be seen to a much greater extent in the next movie. Aardman's first fully CGI movie, which to this day no one's really certain if this was made that way because DreamWorks were pressuring them to make a new movie fast, or because the Aardman storage and studio building tragically burnt down around that time. Even if this movie was done with Aardman's traditional stop motion, a lot of the humour feels like something that is more DreamWorks than Aardman. Not to say that's a bad thing, DreamWorks are very good with writing, but their style of humour is a lot more... I hate to use this term, American, than Aardman usually are, such as the slugs randomly singing pop songs for the purpose of filling up the soundtrack, a well-known DreamWorks staple, and having much more faster action-themed set pieces, as opposed to the more laid-back character-focused scenes in the previous Aardman movies. But those traditional elements are still there, and it's nice to see some different elements in this movie compared to the previous ones. But given DreamWorks' probable interference, added with the fact that it's the lowest-grossing Aardman film of all time, it seems that even Aardman Aardman themselves want to forget this movie exists, but does it deserve to be forgotten? Well, let's take a look. Roddy the Rat, played by a completely unrecognisable Hugh Jackman, is a fancy rat being kept by a rich family in Kensington, and whenever the family are away, he comes out to play, and he has complete free roam of the house and seems to have everything. That is except for company, but all that changes when out of nowhere the Sir Rat Sid, played by Shane Ritchie in one of only two movies he's ever been in, pops up from Roddy's sink and decides to become a lodger in Roddy's house. Naturally Roddy isn't very happy about this and tries to trick Sid into going back into the sewer where he came from by flushing him down the toilet, but Sid triple crosses him and flushes him down instead. But as it turns out, the sewers in this world are more than just poo pipes, there's a whole miniature London down there for the rats made up of rubbish that's been sent down the river, as it were. Despite this, Roddy just wants to get home, thus hitches a ride with smuggler Rita, played by Kate Winslet, and on their way back they have to contend with the kingpin of the sewers, the Toad, played by Ian McKellen and his henchmen. This is again another story that you can see exactly where it's going once Roddy meets up with Rita. It's basically going to be an African queen slash swept away story about the rich, entitled person finding something that they've always been looking for in the last place they'll look. And while it's still a good story and does justice here, it's a bit disappointing that we've just come off a movie with a very original story, and now we're going back to a slightly more derivative one. That being said, the relationship between the two main characters is done really well. It's a bit similar to Ginger and Rocky's relationship in Chicken Run, but with one clearly being more submissive than the other, and with them being brought together and forming a relationship under slightly more forced circumstances, rather than just a chance encounter, which is a very interesting dynamic and makes their development as friends all the more deeper and in Endearing. But of course, their journey is not without opposition. The Toad is on their backs all the way due to them stealing something of his early on in the film. The erratic and manic Spike, who reminds me a lot of Moe from The Simpsons, the passive and almost childlike Whitey, and the Toad's French cousin and sleek secret agent, Le Frog. Bonjour. Speaking of which, this is some of the best voice acting in an Aardman movie yet. Jackman and Winslet are almost unrecognisable in their respective roles. Ian McKellen does a great job with his booming voice as the villain, who is played more comedically compared to the previous ones. But this time it does work, plus his size and power as the literal underworld leader still makes him rather intimidating. Hello, Rita. Hello, handsome. And who is this? Is your new boyfriend a waiter? Boyfriend? Waiter? Andy Serkis does a great voice role like he always does and really gives life to Spike. All right, it's time to bring out the Persuader. The amazingly talented Bill Nye does another great job as Whitey. I used to work in a laboratory up top. Yeah, big shampoo job. I, w I was dark grey when we started. Yeah. Still, it cleared up my dandruff. And the surprising cameo of Jean Renault does a great job as the cynical and snooty stereotypical Frenchman, Le Frog. Forgive me my warty English cousin, but this bizarre obsession with the rats, it is not good for you. 
You are becoming what we friends call Le Fruitcake! You stupid English! With your Yorkshire puddings and your chips and fish, you thought you could defeat Le Frog! Sadly, as I said earlier, while all of these people do a fantastic job, not all of the jokes they say are that great. Now I want to make it clear, I'm not saying the jokes are bad, I'm just saying that some of them really don't fit in an Aardman movie. I appreciate companies branching out and trying new things for their movies, but a lot of these jokes feels like they were put in because they got a note from DreamWorks saying, this tested well, put it in. And I could be overestimating it, but the joke where Spike keeps hitting his nads on the pipe, or as I said at the beginning, the slugs randomly singing pop songs out of nowhere. That seems more like something you'd see in Kung Fu Panda or Shrek. And while they work fine there, ball humour and bending to the zeitgeist has never been something that Aardman is into, at least in this phase of their career. That being said, the jokes that do work are the ones that we see most often, that being how the rats utilise the things in the sewer to make their own little world. It's sort of like a dirtier version of The Great Mouse Detective or An American Tale, and I love it. And you could kind of see where this could have worked as a stop motion film, since they could have used the real deal, like real phones, blenders and so forth. But of course, for whatever the reason is, they decide to make it animated with CGI, and they did still make it look like a traditional Aardman film, and it does work for the most part. And while the story is a bit derivative, it's still very entertaining, and there are times where they do something that you wouldn't expect them to do. Overall, while I can see that this must have been a tough movie for Aardman to make, and the fact that it barely turned a profit probably doesn't help their memory of it, I still like this movie, and I do recommend you check it out if you get the chance. And so we come to the last proper Wallace and Gromit film. Yeah, there were some TV shows and cameos in the future, but this is considered the true last hurrah for the duo. In their final ever-changing occupation, the pair are a very dynamic set of bakers and bread delivery men, and as usual, despite Wallace's quirky way of doing things, the pair are managing to do pretty well. However, Wallace ends up saving and falling for a former bakery spokeswoman, Paella Bakewell, and as per usual when Wallace gets a crush, Gromit gets shoved aside and ignored. But unlike the last time Wallace had a date, this one seems to be a bit more mysterious than the others, and Gromit tries to figure out her secret, and subsequently save Wallace, whilst also getting the attention of Pyla's poodle. Admittedly, there's not a lot to say about this special because it's basically what you'd expect it to be. The animation is still amazing, but there's not really been much improvement to the technology compared to the were-rabbit. The plot is intriguing, but it's the same sort of mysteries with the obvious villain from the get-go and Gromit trying to figure out the meaning behind it all. We've got the exciting set pieces, the thrilling climax, and the goofy scenarios, but that's it, there's really not much to say. Not to say that that's a bad thing, Wallace and Gromit are the kind of characters in films in general where you could just watch them hook up their TV and we'd be entertained by it. They're just that likeable, so it's always great to see them back, and admittedly after the Were Rabbit, this would feel like a step back anyway, though I do always find it odd how there seemed to be very little admission of continuity between the Wallace and Gromit shorts and films, but that's another matter. It does just feel like these characters have so much potential for comedic scenarios, and I'd love to see them go on and do more stuff, but of course the want for making everything look bigger and better than their previous venture is hard when they've already done a movie, so I can't really be that wishing on the whole thing. So as is, Loaf and Death is still great, it just feels a bit like a bit of been there, done that, but we still get some great moments. A lot of new and very good meta jokes, seems as if DreamWorks rubbed off on them more than they'd like to admit, and a great villain. While the villain wasn't as creepy as the moon robot, as memorable as Feathers McGraw, or scary as Preston, it was nice to have a baddie that Wallace and Gromit could actually have a proper conversation with for a change, being again a great combination of funny and intimidating like the Toad, with a fantastic voice by Loose Women's and Coronation Street's Sally Lindsay, who manages to make Paella Oh yeah, spoilers, Pyle's the bad guy, though really who else would it be? Both entertaining, but also dire in the right moments. Overall, since this is the last major thing that Ed Miller Band and Ed Balls' cartoons recreation have ever starred in, it does feel like a decent bookend to the franchise, though it does feel a bit open-ended, since there was potential for more adventures after this. But I imagine that with Peter Salas' ongoing age and blindness, he probably wasn't in the best of shape to keep making new shorts, hence why future Wallace and Gromit ventures were mostly cameo 
cameo appearances after that. Regardless of if it seems a bit derivative from Last Ventures, it's still great to see the pair again one last time, but in terms of Aardman's success as an animation company, well, it'll take a few more years yet to come up with something that really makes an impact. While the friendly tiffs between Park, Lord and DreamWorks have been well publicised, how much they disagreed creatively was never very well publicised. As such, it seems as if they were eager to get away and be more of their own entity, though whether Sony has proven to be better for them for that, we still don't know. But they have made some of their best movies under them in recent years. After they separated, Aardman went to go on to work for Sony Animation, which they still do to this day. But it seems that they weren't quite finished with experimenting with CGI films, as their first venture with Sony was a movie that looks very different from any movie they've done before. But before we get into that, let's take a look at the plot. At the North Pole, Father Christmas, aka Santa for you Atlanteans out there, played by Jim Broadbent, and his team are doing what you'd expect them to do, sorting out presents for the children of Christmas. But the old rustic sleigh and reindeer method seems to have been phased out for more modern techniques, such as a retro reflector giant spaceship, thousands of elves doing most of the work while Santa fumbles about aimlessly, whilst his eldest son and Stephen, played by Hugh Laurie, does most of the coordinating. Thus Santa seems to be more of a techno postman than he used to be, as is the thoughts of his father, Grand Santa, aka the previous Santa Claus, played by the graciously returning Bill Nye. However, there is one person at the pole who still embodies the heart and magic of Christmas, Santa's youngest son, Arthur, played by James McAvoy, who deals with the millions of letters that Santa gets every year. He loves his job and gets to see what all the children love and cherish about Santa think of him, and his endlessly optimistic demeanour means that he's always got a smile on his face. However, due to a technical hitch, a child gets missed on the register. Steve wants to do nothing, as his bureaucratic sensibility makes him feel as if there's nothing they can do, and the job's done anyway, and Santa just blindly agrees with him. But Grand Santa tells Arthur that there is a way, and thus it's up to Arthur, Grand Santa, and an elf that's stowed away named Bryony, played by Ashley Jensen, to get the present to the girl before morning. What's really great about this movie is that it's the first Arbor movie to technically have no villain. I mean, there are arguments to be made towards Steve and possibly the military near the end, but neither are really true villains. Steve is just a character who wants something really badly, becoming the new Santa, and while he does do some arguably sinister things, he never goes full on antagonist, and the military are just trying to do what they think is a good thing. They just lack the context to know what they're really doing. And so it's amazing to truly get that Christmas spirit in this movie, that everyone in the movie makes mistakes, but the other characters help them realise that and help them fix them, and by the end of the movie they're all better people as a result, which is a brilliant way to make a kids movie, especially a Christmas one. That sense of, yeah you're a bit of a dick, but hey we can all be, let me just give you a hand, is so British, and it's a great lesson to give to kids and even adults, plus it really hammers in how important the giving and selflessness of Christmas is, and it's one of the best looking Christmas movies I've ever seen, even if a lot of the locales they go to don't necessarily reflect that, but I'll get into that later, but it does look undoubtedly jolly and festive most of the time, and that's one of the things that makes me love this movie so much. But the other thing is the characters. While this is a bit more of an expansive cast than most Arbman movies, they do all do fantastic jobs. McAvoy's voice is a bit annoying at times, but his optimism and innocence makes him really likeable. Plus, McAvoy is a fantastic actor and he really sells the more emotional moments. How can I ever write another letter saying that Santa cares? Jim Broadbent proves his worth once again as one of the greatest character actors and Santa actors of all time with his performance. Here's to me! Doing an even better job next year! Hugh Laurie, while seeming to phone in some bits of his performance, does work in regards to this character, and he has some of the funniest moments in the film. My S1 festivise the world at 1,860 times the speed of sound! A returning Imelda Staunton plays Santa's wife, who is a great background character who is clearly totally in control of her life and loves it. Trelew is on a course of 187.7 degrees from the geographic pole, but as it's the old sleigh, we should allow a drift margin of a thousand miles either side of the Greenwich Meridian. I've got a sweater for Arthur, your father's pills, 
and some nice sweet tea. Bryony is also a tad annoying and not one of the strongest characters, but she does have her moments. But by far the best character in the movie is Grand Santa. Don't matter what you come up with, son. You may be the next in line, but you'll never get to be Santa unless you knock him off. Once again, like everything he does, Bill Nye does an incredible performance as this curmudgeonly, slightly bigoted, stubborn old fart who is still incredibly lovable and has the best lines in the movie by far. It's impossible. They used to say it was impossible to teach women to read. He's also great at providing exposition in the history of the clauses, which are the moments that I always have a great time hearing, and it makes me want to hear more about the history of this family. Seriously, how has that not become a spin-off yet? I've seen this before. Slave fever, they call it. Pressure of Christmas sends a man do lally tap. Santa Claus the 16th got it, 1802. Every child that year got a sausage nailed to a piece of bark. There's also some really cool cameos in the movie too, such as Michael Palin, Eva Longoria, and even my old chancellor, Sanjeev Bhaskar, all of whom do great jobs, even despite having less than five minutes of screen time between them. All of these actors and actresses do great jobs, not just with the jokes, but making these characters seem real, not just caricatures, even if some of the voices like Laura are a bit jarring in how they sound no different from their real selves. This is a movie that sadly has only recently hit its stride in its popularity and people realising how popular it is. Oh don't get me wrong, it was very successful when it came out, but it came out around about the same time as The Muppets and Hugo, so not a lot of people saw it at the time. It's only been until recently when people have started to see it and realise how great it is. It's also nice to see Aardman do a road trip style movie. We saw shades of that and flushed away, but the sewer sadly doesn't lend itself to many exciting locales, but with Santa Slay, we can literally go anywhere and they really do take advantage of that opportunity, visiting places like Kenya, Mexico and even Canada. Toronto's in Canada! The Santas always come through Canada! Nobody lives here! And I always love this narrative in films. I don't know what it is about it, but a literal journey just seems to bear the most opportunities in storytelling. There are some downsides to the movie though. Firstly, while the use of details, motion, and most of the other little details about the animation are stellar in this movie, the designs and faces do look rather odd. I don't know how much of that was either Aardman or Sony, but it does look a tad creepy, which puts this up there with the Polar Express and the Rankin Bass movies in terms of creepy animated Christmas movies. That and I feel that there was some lost potential with how the world perceives Santa, as some people in the world, most specifically the military, don't even seem to know that Santa is even a thing. I don't mean that they're not believing, I mean it's like they've never heard of the guy, which is weird. And I do really wish we could hear more of Grand Santa's adventures in the history of the clauses, but I guess that's the sign of a great movie. You just want to see and know more about it. Overall, After Christmas is an amazing movie and really deserves to be a new Christmas staple, and this was a great first movie for Aardman's collaboration with Sony, and more for Sony than Aardman since it's nice that they have some good animated movies in their portfolio, but of course it was only a matter of time before Aardman got back to their roots, and next year we'd see one of the biggest and best examples of that. And now we come to my favourite Aardman movie, which is once again one that people tend to forget about, as it's sandwiched between the two more popular Aardman movies of the Sony era. But is there a reason why people forget about this movie? Well, let's take a look. In the receding days of piracy, Queen Victoria, played yet again by Imelda Staunton, does she have anything else better to do with her time? Is desperate to rub out what little remains of the pirate menace, but she's got to contend with the one and only pirate captain, played by an unrecognisable Hugh Grant. Behind every captain, with glittering eyes and a luxuriant beard, <laughs> luxurious. Luxurious. Yeah. Yeah. A briny rose. But PC has his own agenda, as he's desperate to win the Pirate of the Year award, which is continually won by his rivals, Peg Leg Hastings, played by Lenny Henry, <laughs> Barbados Liz, played by Selma Hayek, and Black Bellamy, played by Jeremy Piven. After several desperate and failed attempts to gain gold, his number two, played by Martin Freeman, encourages him that it's not all about the treasure, it's about the adventures, but they still need that booty, so they raid one last ship, which just so happens happens to be the Beagle as piloted by Charles Darwin, played by David Tennant. After a little misunderstanding, Charles makes the pirate captain a deal. He'll give the pirate captain all the gold he wants if he's allowed to present the captain's 
pet dodo Polly to the Queen as a scientific discovery, the captain agrees and the crew head off to London to contend with the police, scientists, Charles's chimp butler, Mr. Bobo, and the Queen herself, all for a little recognition. I think what makes this my favourite of the Aardman movies as of yet is two things. One, it's got my favourite cast of any Aardman movie yet. And two, while the story is a little bit of a retread of the plot of Chicken Run, it actually manages to put a new spin on it. And for the most part, it has a very unpredictable plot, making it one of the more unique Aardman films. While you can imagine some of the plot beats that are going to happen, as the movie progresses, it's like it goes out of its way to take your predictions and completely throw them in the bin and do the opposite. For example, Charles many times tries to betray the pirate captain, and you'd expect halfway through the movie that he'll realise what he's doing and stops. But no, he actually goes through with it, and while he does learn his lesson in the third act, it's surprising that he did actually get away with his plan, for the most part. Another example is the jokes. These are some of the most surreal jokes we've seen in the Aardman films, and it reminds me a lot of Monty Python's Flying Circus, or even a TV show they did, Rex the Runt, and the majority of them are hilarious. People who live alone are always serial killers. <laughs> Some are a bit too odd, like during the sad moment Jermaine Clement starts singing a song that spoofs the typical third act come down of consequences. And while I do normally love Jermaine Clement, this isn't one of his better songs, and it does come off as trying too hard to be meta. I'm not upset because you left me this way. My eyes are just a little sweaty today. I've been looking around and I'm searching for you. Which has never been one of Aardman's strongest style of humour, but most of the time the jokes really work, if they're not raising the attention of certain communities that is. One thing about the movie that's both hilarious and irritating doesn't even have to do with the movie itself, it's the advertising for it. One of the biggest jokes in the trailer is when the pirate captain boards a ship asking for gold, but the passengers of the ship reluctantly tell them that it's a leper boat, and one of the passengers' arms falls off as a result. Gold? Afraid we don't have any gold, old man! This is a leper boat! <laughs> See? However, despite this being how they actually treated leper sufferers back in the days of piracy, the leprosy community, and no, I'm not joking about that, got up in arms, excuse the pun, about how this was offensive to their people, and so when the movie was released, they changed the line to plague ship. Gold? This is a plague boat, old man. I'd give my right arm for some gold. <laughs> or my left. <laughs> This is hilarious in the idea that there's even a leper community, and that they are so well publicised and that they were able to get a movie that couldn't be reanimated changed, but also in how they got offended by a joke that is not only accurate, since this is how they used to treat lepers, and while I'm not saying it was the right thing to do this, they had no way of treating lepers back then, so they had to do this to stop it from spreading, but also in how it's really not that offensive. But that's just from my point of view, and I've never had leprosy, so I wouldn't know. It's also interesting to to see Aardman try their hand at 2D animation with the map scenes. They've done 2D animation before, but never in one of their bigger productions, and it looks great, even if they are very small moments. The movie has also got a lot of callbacks to previous Aardman films, such as the stairway sequences very reminiscent of the hallway train chase and the wrong trousers, the battle in the kitchen at the end is very reminiscent of the fight with Paella in the Loaf and Death, and even the idea of an evil woman trying to kill a bird is very familiar to Mrs. Tweedy from Chicken Run. Speaking of which, while she does have trouble deciding whether she wants to be a serious or jokey villain, Queen Victoria is a great baddie, and a lot of that comes down to her performance by Imelda Staunton. Imelda has always had a gift for playing lovably hateable characters, as evidence as how she played a character even more detestable than the Dark Lord himself in the Harry Potter films with Dolores Umbridge, and Queen Victoria is very comparable to said character, and it's a great addition to the Aardman rogues gallery, even though I do wish that her more comedic moments were downplayed, since she could have been as intimidating as Mrs. Tweedy. To this day, I'm still not quite sure why people didn't like this movie. Maybe it's because the general public were bored with the Aardman style. I mean, this was around the time when Leica animations were starting to gain steam, so maybe they were being outdone by them, or perhaps to the more emotionally gripping movies they've done in the past, this one felt a lot more like a downgrade. But really, who cares? It's just meant to be a fun comedy, and in that regard, I love it. It's definitely a highlight of the Aardman portfolio in my books, but sadly for the company it's Itself, it was a bit of a disappointment. But come three years later, and one of the most surprisingly popular movies with no dialogue will be unveiled to the world.
after the success that the character had in A Close Shave, Shaun the Sheep was the next big thing for Aardman after Wallace and Gromit. After a few years of throwing ideas around, they made a TV series based off of this beloved little lamb, which eventually led to the movie we're talking about today. The series was a great way of Aardman experimenting with a format that they had fiddled with before, but this time they went all out with it. Silent comedy. The Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton style of vaudeville slapstick that only had the characters speak using noises and vocalisation, and it was a great success. I remember watching this show, and while I admittedly I would watch things like Batman and Power Rangers more, this was still a great show. It was funny, sweet, with all the fun of the great Aardman charm, and it lasted an impressive five series with a spin-off Timmy Time on CBeebies. For those who aren't aware of the show, it focuses around the continuing adventures of Shaun the Sheep, the level-headed cool sheep from a close shave, played by Justin Fletcher now. <laughs> is now the leader of a flock of sheep in a farm, run by the farmer, and that's not me being lazy with not looking up his name, he doesn't actually have one, and he and his flock go out on all sorts of misadventures right under the farmer's nose without him noticing, often resulting in the sometimes antagonist and sometimes ally Blitzer, the farmer's dog, getting roped in to make sure the farmer doesn't find out about the shenanigans that are going on. Simple but enjoyable hijinks. And so we come to the movie, and we definitely go to the next level, or town in this case, for this one, Sean and the flock are getting bored of their repetitive life and they want a break, so they engineer a plan to get the farmer out of the way and do what they feel like. However, it goes tits up, as you'd expect, and the farmer ends up being sent into a nearby town and through some unfortunately placed balls gets amnesia so we can't remember who he is or what he does. The sheep naturally get upset about this and they go into the city to find the farmer and rejog his memory, all while trying to keep a low profile to avoid the sinister animal control man. A Trumper, voiced by Omagility. First of all, it's nice to have an armor movie that goes back to the simple stories and minimal elements, much like the old Wallace and Gromit shorts, and the fact that the whole movie is made via non-verbal pantomime makes it fit all the better, since a large grand epic scale wouldn't have fitted with that motif, much like how The Artist, despite being a very well-made movie, did feel very small in scale, and it fit the style, as it does here, and the animation, while still up to the quality of their most recent films, looks a lot more basic and it really works, and it made me realise that Aardman really works with being more simple. I love it when they go big, but these more low-key movies do really show off their craft and talent to the best of their ability. Some of the models do look a bit too old school for Aardman though, which does contrast a bit with the more detailed models of the farmer and the pest control guy. In fact, some of them even look like characters from a Will Vinton movie, and as much as I love Will Vinton, I don't ever want to see those two stop-motion worlds collide. What's your name? Satan. This movie also feels the most British out of the Aardman movies, with it's so much more modern British iconography, it genuinely feels like you're in a town in the UK, with the NHS hospital, the buses, the choices of music, even the references they do, which aren't that many, but the ones they do do are very British, and it's great. They do a fantastic job with the expressions in this movie, which is especially impressive since I've always thought that the traditional Aardman models give a very limited range when it comes to showing expressions, but in here, a movie where the expressions are very important, they are very good, and very deadpan. Actually, the animation in general is great, and it's lovely to return to the painted backdrops instead of the CGI ones, which is great to see again, and the whole thing feels like an older album project. It reminded me a lot of The Wrong Trousers, especially with the Manchester-like city setting and the scenes where the sheep are leading the farmer around while he's asleep. Also, speaking of The Wrong Trousers, pause that scene where Trump is looking at the wall of captured animals, and you'll see quite a few familiar faces in there. There are some joke setups that are very predictable, and you can tell exactly what's going to happen from the start, which does make this movie a bit of a slog sometimes, but they do still add some interesting twists here and there, like where the amnesiac farmer goes to a hair salon and has to do some hairdressing, and of course shears him like a sheep, but the guy he cuts the hair for actually does like it, and it leads to a new hairstyle phenomenon. It was predictable, but still funny, and the one character who always made me laugh was the villain, A Trumper. Homage Lily is really good good as a Trumper, and yes I can insert an obvious Donald Trump joke here, but I've done that enough in my videos, so I'll skip that for now. I'm a big fan of the former face of MoneySupermarket.com before they started using disturbingly sexy men and random 80s cartoon characters for their ads, and he does a great job with the vocalisations, and shows that even celebrities who are not used to this style of acting can be very good at it. I was excited to see him in the movie, but also slightly wary since he has got a knack for picking some stinkers in terms of movies to be in, but even with that, 
guy. He often is the highlight in the bad movies he's in, and here, while the movie itself is still great, that's still no exception, and he's a great villain. He has his comedic elements, but he's very intimidating, especially near the end where he gets legitimately scary, Cape Fear style. Speaking of which, while the climax does feel more toned down to some of Armand's former films, it's still a very tense final bout, especially since the characters rarely get into mortal peril in the TV show, so to see the stakes raised from the show and done effectively is a great turn. Overall, while I admittedly dismissed this movie when it came out since I thought it was just going to be a bigger budget version of the TV series, which it basically is, I see now that it's perfect for this movie, and even more so for the Aardman Library. I don't know if I'd say it's my new favourite for me, but it's definitely a real treat, and so gleefully simple and charming. Definitely check it out, or at least you could have if they didn't take it from Netflix for no reason, even though most of the other Aardman movies are still on there. Thanks for that by the way, that made trying to find this movie for the sake of this review really easy and fun. Man, Netflix can be annoying sometimes. And at last, we come to the latest and largest Arma movie yet, Early Man. Is this a solid bedrock hit, or does it sink like a stone? In the last few years of the Stone Age, a group of Neanderthals live in a small bowl-like valley that was created after the cataclysm event that wiped out the dinosaurs. They live in peace hunting rabbits all day, but the over-optimistic member of the tribe, Doug, played by Eddie Redmayne, tries to convince his chief, played by Timothy Spall, that maybe they should think of hunting bigger animals. But his chief dismisses this as he's scared of change. However, change will be coming to the valley sooner than he wanted, as the Bronze Age has entered the valley, and they're looking for ore to mine, led by their vicious, pompous and greedy leader, Lord Nuth, played by Tom Hiddleston. After some antics, Doug ends up getting thrown into the middle of an early form of football, and challenges Nuth's team to a game for the fate of their valley. With the help of an aspiring footballer named Guna, the race is on to get Doug's tribe ready to go against the best players in the world, all face working down the mine for the rest of their lives. No! What's a mine? So this is a story that, excluding the cavemen, we've all heard before. The little ragtag sports team that goes up against the best and tries their best to win. And while it isn't a bad narrative, we have seen this a lot before. So what makes this movie stand out from films like Cool Running, The Sandlot and The Bad News Bears? Besides being animated and set in the Stone Age, of course. Well, for one, the cast. This is probably the biggest and most impressive cast of any Aardman movie yet. Eddie Redmayne's very soft, optimistic Doug is a great protagonist. He said we'll spend the rest of our miserable lives working down a mine. But our ancestors played football, we know they did. I still believe we can do this. The returning legendary Timothy Spall as the chief is great, though his performance, while good, isn't quite as standout as his performance as Nick from Chicken Run. Couldn't we try hunting something? Bigger. What? Like a hair? But he does still do a good job as the typical fearful old man who's scared of progression. Maisie Williams as Guna, whose name sounds like a Scottish insult, does a good job, though she seems to have trouble with the French accent she's supposed to be doing. It seems to go in and out. Where have you been, the Stone Age? They may be great. But what they're not is a team, and that's how you can beat them. Plus, it's hard for me to like anything Maisie Williams is in since she played one of the most annoying and boring characters in recent Doctor Who memory, but her character is fine, way better than most of the typical token girl characters in the sports movie, and she actually has a personality and is funny. I'm nearly 32! Okay, that is old. And the supporting roles are great too. The IT crowds Richard Ayawadi, Gina Yashere, Johnny Vegas, Rob Brydon, they all do great jobs, though sadly they aren't really given a lot of time to be explored or be really funny, since a lot of the screen time is taken up by Doug and Guna. However, one screen hog of the movie that I would gladly watch for hours is the villain, Lord Nuth. Bonds! So cold and hard and slippery. Tom Hiddleston's Lord Nuth is one of not only his best performances, but one of the best performances in any Aardman movie ever. It feels like they mixed the Frog and Queen Victoria together, but he does bring a lot of his own elements to the role. And while I am disappointed that he's a more comedic villain again, seriously, I miss the sinister villains. He is still very funny and has a ton of memorable lines. Stefano! Non so am feasted. You're going down to mine. You're going down to mine. And he's also probably the first character in an Ardner movie to swear. It turns out your tribe 
were totally crap at football. He is by far the best part of the movie, and it made the whole movie more enjoyable, even through the most boring moments. Knowing that he'd be back made it worth it. While the focus around football is a very clever idea and gives it that British feel, I do worry that this might make the movie a bit alienated to American audiences. Then again, animated movies based around American sports aren't that great themselves. Space Jam, anyone? I will admit that they use the sport in a very clever way, referencing famous tropes and games of the past, even poking fun at the general playing attitude of various countries like Germany, France, and of course England. They even reference the old 1966 World Cup where England won, though thankfully without the typical English trope of going on about it over and over again because we haven't won since then, or mentioning the war in relation to it. Seriously football hooligans, stop doing that! Nobody cares anymore! Though while there are a lot of good jokes in this movie, I have to say the constant puns and penis humour does tire on me quite often, especially since most of them aren't very funny. Come on then, let's see you tackle! But hey, a majority of the jokes are still very good overall, and there's some decent Flintstone style humour with making modern devices out of animals and such, and the odd bit of Aardman's trademark surreal humour is still there too. And while the movie lacks the great background details of previous Aardman shorts, it does have the quirkiest and oddest sense of humour out of all of them, with giant ducks, talking rocks, football being created by a meteor that killed the dinosaurs, and Rob Brydon voice bird messages. You better not screw it up, Noof. Oh, yeah. The animation is something that I have trouble deciding if it was the best Aardman has ever done or one of the most unbalanced. What I mean by that is that this movie uses the most CGI intermixed with stop motion out of the whole Aardman library, such as with the backgrounds and some of the more ambitious effects. But while that worked great for the Leica movies, here it's just really obvious and the kind of thing that takes you away from the world. You never get the feeling that what you're seeing is right in front of you, you just start thinking that it's all CGI. And while I'm not condemning the use of CGI, since some of the things they had to use it for were totally understandable, I do feel a lot more effort could have been put into this movie to make it look more like a traditional Aardman film. And admittedly I'm not sure who made this happen, since Sony has been very respectful so far to Aardman in letting them do their own thing, this does feel like something that they might have insisted on, but that's just conjecture, and despite that distraction, the parts that are traditional Aardman style do look great and are still very charming. This is also a movie that sadly suffers from a very derivative plot. It's essentially the Mighty Ducks or Bad News Bears, or for a more modern and British example, Bend It Like Beckham, the story of a plucky but underdog team trying to win the tournament with great stakes on the line. And while this is a very beloved narrative, we've seen it so many times before, and to be honest, we're kind of sick of it now, especially since, besides the Stone Age theme, this movie does very little to make it different from usual, other than the setting, and the stakes being higher than normal in these kinds of movies. So I wasn't really invested in this movie as the other Aardman movies, since while a lot of Aardman plots are a tad predictable, this one was extremely so, and really only the characters and silly jokes were enough to keep me engaged. But that being said, I am glad that I saw this movie, and I definitely will see it again in the future. And thus brings us to the end of Aardman. I hope you enjoyed this look back at the biggest and most successful British animation company in the world, and who knows, if this proved popular enough I might come back to it again at some point in the future. But for now, I'll see you all in the next review. Bye.